Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this session on step-by-step -step the HIG FEM verification trail. Glad to have all of you here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. Thank you. Just a brief about our organization as we go on. Our organization is peer-headed by Ms. Karen Egberg, who is our CEO, and she has been in the sustainability line for many, many years right now. We've been working on different projects on uh, HIG FEM, on SLCP, on materiality, on strategy development, uh, chemical management implementations, etc. And Karen has also been awarded the HIG FEM Verification Leadership Award at the SAC full member meeting in Barcelona, previous ITMA. And before we go on, just a brief also about myself. I'm basically a textile technologist with over 20 years of experience in the textile safety and in the consulting domain. I'm a lead auditor for 14,001 and 45,001. In the markets here, I have been a climate action plan assessor and also a sustainability awards assessor with the CII. And with leadership and sustainability, I've been working in the capacity of a HIG FEM trainer and a verifier. We've been conducting a number of trainings since 2020. And uh, I'm also a ZDHC trainer and a BRM verifier with leadership and sustainability. Before we go on, just a small note as usual that all of this material is copyrighted with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and with leadership and sustainability. So please refrain from distributing these slides outside of your organization but we would be very happy that you use them with, for all of your internal training sessions and that all of your team members are up to steam with whatever the requirements from HIG FEM. And as we go on, just a quick brief on the platform that we will be using. We will all be interacting with each other via the Zoom platform. And it, I would request that you put in all of your questions into the question and answer section so that it is documented and that in case something is missed, we would be able to send you a mail with the reply. Please do not put it into the chat function. You can just communicate with me on the chat, but please do not put in any questions into the chat function since it may be missed. And this is where you would require to put in your questions at the bottom of the panel. You will see the question and answer section and you can send this to us. And in a follow-up mail, you will also receive a link to the recording of the session, as well as a link to download the presentation. So let's go on and look at the agenda for today. We will be talking about uh, air emissions. This is the impact area that we are going to focus on in this webinar. We will have enough time for questions and answers. We will also be giving you our offer for training and verification and a brief about leadership and sustainability, the team involved, the, the locations where we are, etc. So this is what we would be talking on today. And I look forward to spending the next hour with all of you. So let's take a look at the different impact areas that are there in HIG FEM. And here you can see that there are a total of eight sections which are which are there. And here we also talked about how we differentiate the different sections in the HIG FEM. So if you look at these sections, we have two management system sections, that is your environmental management system and your chemical management system, where which are very document intensive, where you will have to maintain your processes, etc. You have sections like energy, water, and waste, which are continuous improvement sections. And then you have your wastewater and air emissions, which are limit sections. So here, what we are expected to ensure is that we are maintaining our, uh, our pollutants within the limits that are prescribed by the local regulations or the regulations as required by the brands. This is how we differentiate each of these sections. And so here you can see 
that in the air emission sections, your approach requires to be slightly different to what you would do for your energy, water and waste. So air emissions are basically regulated to a set level. While if you're looking at energy, water and waste, these are continuous improvement sections. So before we go on, I would also like to give you a small differentiation or give you an understanding of the terms which we will be using in the air emission sections. So the first term that I would like to introduce you to is point source or stack emissions. So these are stationary identifiable sources of emissions that release pollutants into the atmosphere. So for example, you might have a boiler on site or you might have a generator on site. All of these equipment which are which are stationary, they will basically emit point source or stack emissions. These are all the, the equipment perhaps that are used for your operations. Then you have your mobile emissions. Now, mobile emissions are from equipment that moves from one location to another. For example, this could include your motor vehicles, your construction equipment. Let's say there is a lot of construction activity which is happening within your site or within your premises, then for example, mobile emissions may be one sort of emissions which will, which will require to be taken into consideration. The other uh, introduction that I would like to make to you is about non-point source or fugitive emissions. Now these are emissions which do not pass through any type of stack or chimney or vent. They are basically occurring because of maybe certain activities which are which are happening on the site maybe chemical mixing maybe screen printing maybe uh, uh, some processes on shoes which, which are causing vocs to be emitted so all of these are called non-point source or fugitive emissions and here we have to be cognizant about what type of emissions can occur from the from from the kind of processes that we are following at the facility. So in HIG FEM, we would require to first of all look at the applicability criteria. You know that in each section we have we have a set of applicability questions. So a part of it is posed to you in the site info and permit section. But in air emissions as well, you will have certain questions which you will have to answer based on which your questions are going to be formulated or framed and posed to you. One of the first questions is whether you have operations equipment. So here you would require to report, let's say if you have a generator, if you have a boiler, if you have industrial ovens, air conditioning, etc. all of that would require to be reported. The next question is regarding the processes and substances that you are you are currently undertaking in your manufacturing processes that you're currently undertaking in the facility. So this could be your printing, your drying, your dyeing, etc. So all of those would require to be reported. Let's say you have spray painting, you have PP processes, laser, laser applications, etc. All of that would require to be indicated. And the third question in applicability, which is going to be posed to you is, are you monitoring your air emissions? Again, when it is a very small unit where, you know, who has not been sensitized to the fact that the operations are going to be causing a lot of air impact, we have seen that some very small units are not cognizant of the type of air emissions that uh, the processes can lead to. And that's why we would like to explain that a bit more as we go on. So once your applicability questions are posed to you, then you would require to understand what are the type of processes that are there and what is the source of the pollutants? What are the type of pollutants that the facility is generating? So here you have, you have your for example, you can have energy production, which is happening on site. You, your source is basically the emissions from the boilers and the pollutants that are generated will be your NOx, SOx and particulate matter in this particular case. 
you could have coating, drying, et cetera, as processes which are happening within the facility. The emission is from a high temperature oven. And here again, you will have volatile organic compounds, which can be considered as pollutants. Or for example, if you have sizing, then you have PVA, which is in use. You could have pollutants again, which are NOx, SOx, and carbon monoxide. If you have bleaching on site, then you can have chlorine, chlorine dioxide gases, which are escaping, which could be pollutants, which you would require to monitor. And also for chemical storage, you would have to consider what are the kind of VOCs, which could perhaps be generated from the chemicals that you are you're storing on in your storage facility and are you in a position to control them? Okay, I have a question here. What abatement device or processes can be used for on-site fugitive non-point source emissions? We will be coming to that question very soon, Duan. Thank you for that. Let's go on. and. Uh, here again, we are classifying all of the pollutants or all of the air emissions into one of the following types of sources. It could be a point source that is a stationary or a fixed points process stack or a vent. It could be fugitive emissions. Fugitive emissions will arise when you are undertaking different processes. So this could be printing, which is done on site. This could be chemical mixing, which is done on site. This could be spray painting, which is done on site. Molding in shoes, uh, for example. All of these are examples where you would require or you could possibly have the fugitive source of emissions, which we had to, to record into our um, processes. And the other source of fugitive emissions is also refrigerants. So refrigerants are also commonly emitted as fugitive emissions. And this can cause G emissions. And we will, HIG FEM basically reports the, the air emissions, which are actually fugitive emissions, which are arising from your facility also in your GFP reporting. As you are aware, we already spoke about it in the energy section that the HIG FEM calculates your energy uh, reporting values basically and converts them into the G emissions, which they report on the platform. And I would just like to give you, show you how this is done. So you can see here the greenhouse gases. If you see the overview in your HIG FEM dashboard, you will see there are two different sources which are reported. You will have you have both the energy sources as well as you have your air emission sources. And this air emissions is basically the G emissions that that is being calculated. Let's go back to our slides. Okay, and so having understood what are the types of emissions that are there, let's take a look at also some examples. So here we have some examples for point source air emissions and also for fugitive air emissions. So your point source is basically from your chimneys, from your boiler, from your generator, et cetera, where you have a stack and it is coming out. Or you have another example where you have uh, suction which is happening on the top of a printing table and all of the emissions are then coming out of a stack. So this is a point source air emissions on the left hand side and on the right hand side what are examples of fugitive air emissions. So here let's say you have chemical mixing which is happening this could create fugitive emissions. If you have screen printing for example again that is a possibility where you will have fugitive emissions coming into play. And here I would like to take your attention to basically the ZDHC uh, site. Now ZDHC changed their, changed their outlook from an 
from an output type of a chemistry where the product was being tested to the input type of chemistry where the input was actually being tested. And in during this process, they, they understood also that you have, apart from just the chemicals that are there, you also have to consider the different other pollutants which are generated by a facility. And it was early in 2021 that they came out with the air emissions position paper. This is a great paper where a lot of information is given. We have given you a link here to this particular air emissions position paper, which talks about how you would be able to control the different types of pollutants within a facility. So we might not, of course, be able to share all of the information that is there in this particular document, but we have, we have indicated what are the type of facility operations which happen? What are the kind of pollutants which, which are generated with the facility operations? How do you consider them as a pollutant? And then in your process operations, again, you have both your point source emissions as well as your non-point source emissions. So you have your stack emissions, your solvents, exhausts, et cetera. And in your process operations, you also have your non-point source emissions, which are your fugitive emissions or your unexhausted emissions. And that is the example that has been taken up here in order to just give you an example of how these emissions are, are uh, coming out of the facility. And let's take a look at the uh, different levels in the air emissions section. So you have a total of seven questions in the air emission section. So level one is very heavily populated. You can see here that you have five questions in level one. Level two is where you are asking questions just beyond your requirements, beyond your legal requirements. That's managing your emissions beyond permit. And level three is where you are looking at modernizing equipment where you are looking at questions on how you would be able to take your facility from, from the current level to a much, much higher level. So that is your level three question. And level one is all of your operations and tracking, which is being done here. And you can see that based on your applicability, you have only operations emissions, you will only be asked operations emissions questions. If you have only process emissions, you will be asked only process emissions questions. So it is basically based on your applicability that the questions will then be posed to you. And let's go through each of the questions one by one and understand how we have to, we have to answer them. So we come to the very first question here, which is the question on how do you track your air emissions from operations? And please enter the data for all air emissions. You have to select all of the pollutants that are associated with the with this emission source. And it this question basically excludes any type of quest, any type of production processes that you are following at your facility. And again, here we have given a link to the EPA site, which is also very informative on the type of pollutants. How are you in a position to control it? So here you would require to talk about, let us say you have both a boiler, you have both a generator, as well as certain other point source emission from where you could possibly have pollutants. You will have to talk about the source of the pollutants. What is the emission from the source? How are you tracking it? What are the type of pollutants that are generated from that source? Is this regulated by a particular permit? Do you have to show and show the local authorities that you are remaining within the regulations, perhaps in a particular period of time? And any additional comments? All of this information would require to be indicated in your question one for your operation emissions tracking. Here it is rather detailed. You, ha you have to actually identify each and every source from where the pollutant could occur in your 
a specific case and then report that on the platform. And this, for example, is a very good way in which you are able to track all of your air emissions. This is not something which is very common in the industry, but this is a best practice and we would highly recommend that you go in for this. In, in this inventory table here, you can see that you are you can summarize all of the emission sources that are there within the facility. How are you uh, tracking it? What are the type of pollutants that are there? What is the concentration? How are you determining this? this pollutant type, maybe there is there are certain tests that you are conducting based on the local regulations. What are the control devices that are in place? And also here is mentioned the applicable regulations and the testing that is required. This is a great way in which you would be able to summarize all of the emissions that are happening from the facility. And yeah, coming then to question number two, which is on production processes emission tracking. So we saw the emission tracking, how we could do this from our operations. Our next question is on the production processes emissions tracking. And here you are expected to track the air emissions, whatever are happening from the facility, from the production angle. So here you will have to select all of the processes which are selected. What is the emission from the source? What is the emission source title? How are you tracking it? What are the type of pollutants that, that you are actually tracking? And what are the regulations that are followed? So this again is something that, that, that would be required. So I just like to explain a little that in this particular question, it is about all of the indoor air pollutions, the fugitive type of sources where you don't have any kind of stack that, that you're expected to report. So you shouldn't enter any of your point source emissions in here. You can calculate and track these emissions using health and safety indoor air quality test reports that you might perhaps be performing in your facility. And uh, I can see one more question here, which is our local government and third parties have no way to do particulate matter detection. And the local government does not require the emission concentration of PM. Can we buy handheld detection equipment to detect PM emitted by boilers? Yes, you can. If you, so long as you are calibrating your equipment and saying that this is how you are tracking your your particulate matter and this is how you are recording and keeping it, it will definitely be accepted. There's one more question. All type of air emissions, including emissions from refrigerants should be included in the inventory. Yes, please. All types of air emissions should be included into the inventory because this will help you to track and improve upon what you have done in a particular year. Uh, there is one more. It is point source of emissions technically coming from smoke or fume stack and exhaust hood and fugitive sources are not sucked by exhaust hood or duct. Yes, you have understood it right, Ms. Doan. That is correct. Okay, let's move on. So we talked about the production processes emissions tracking, what we would require to, to understand and track and how we would require to do that. And you should have ideally again, an inventory of emissions to air for all of the sources of emissions from the production processes. You should also be able to have records, test records or estimations in case you are doing, let us say you have VOCs, you are estimating this from the MSDS of a particular chemical, then you should be able to show the calculations that you are making to the verifier who is coming to check that on detailing how the quantity of emissions are reported and were calculated totally. So that's your question number two. And next we come to question number three, which is on refrigerants. And here I showed you on the platform on the dashboard, how you, how HIG FEM is reporting both your 
G emissions from the energy section as well as the as whatever are the refrigerants that you are taking. So the premise here when in HIG FEM is that if there is any kind of refrigerant leakage that has happened from your side, it will be calculated and added on to your to your G emission as a facility. The question that FEM asks you is, did your facility add additional refrigerants to any of the existing equipment during your reporting year? Now, you could be using refrigerants for different, uh, different purposes within your facility. It could just be air conditioning. It could be certain other processes which require refrigerants as well. So you will have to have a record of all the refrigerants that you maintain at your facility. What is the quantity of refrigerant that is added? What is the unit of measure? How are you tracking this? And what is if there is a leakage that is happening from, from any of the equipment, what is the plan for fixing the leakage is also something that you are required to report. And here again is an example of how you will be able to calculate some of the refrigerants. So the ODS or the ozone depleting substances, all of them have global warming potential. That is the GWP that are assigned to individual ODSs. So these are used to calculate their relevant greenhouse gas emissions in terms of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. This is an example calculation that we have provided. The global warming potential, for example, of R22 gas is 1500, which is reported. Therefore, if you're looking at the tons of carbon dioxide produced, from the release of 10 kg. 10 kg is equivalent to 0 0.01 ton of R22. So it will be calculated as mass in tons into the global warming potential of the gas. So here it will be 0 0.01 ton into 1500 and which will give you a total of 15 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent which has actually escaped from your facility. And here again, we have to be mindful of what are the type of refrigerants that are there within, within our facility. Perhaps you have uh, 10 machines which have a particular gas which is involved, but you have 20 other machines which are there in the facility which have a different type of a gas. You will have to maintain an inventory of the entire set of refrigerants which are there. What is, what is the total? amount that that you have what is the what is the how is the equipment being looked at maybe there are regular checks which are done in a year you will have to maintain that this is how we would be able to talk about the carbon dioxide equivalent of a gas and here again, you will require to maintain an inventory of all the ODSs that are stored under, under your facility, that is within your facility boundaries. You will have to identify and comply with all of the applicable laws. For example, in California, if you look at, if you look at some of the new laws which are coming in, there are laws which, uh, which prescribe and say that any of the new buildings should not have any refrigerants which have a global warming potential greater than 750. If you're looking at R22, we saw, saw that the global warming potential there is almost 1500. So it is not permissible in certain areas that you have, you have refrigerants which are above a particular global warming potential. And this is again something that you have to research and understand based on the location where you are. And you will have to implement a regular maintenance program for whatever is the ODSs containing equipment to prevent any type of leaks and unintentional release. And here, like I said, any release that is there from the facility is going to be taken directly into your, into your calculation for your G emissions. So that's why we have to be extremely mindful of what is released and what is it that we are reporting on the platform. And Let's say you do want to in, implement a phase out of ODSs which are used on site. 
you would require to have a action plan. We have already shown you how you can maintain an action plan. Similarly, in your environmental management discussions within the facility, you would have to identify which are the ones which have very high global warming potential. Do you want to phase them out? How, what is your plan to phase them out is also something that you would require to indicate. This again is basically data and we had talked about quantitative data management in our, in, in our energy section, but we would just like to touch upon what we should be doing about the data also for the refrigerants part of it. So there are some do's and don'ts which we are expected to be mindful of when we are dealing with data. We have to review the source data against aggregated totals to ensure that it is accu accurate. So let us say you are reporting that there is a certain amount of R22 which has been replaced in a particular year. You have to maintain from where have you recorded this information, whether it was a maintenance that was done, whether you have the correct invoices. All of this will be verified by whoever is coming on site. You have to also ensure that the most recent and updated versions of the data tracking spreadsheets are being used. You saw how we have to do the calculations of the total, total carbon dioxide equivalent that we are going to be maintaining. So please, when you are looking at these calculations, ensure that you are maintaining the calculations in the right sheets. If there are corrections which are made, it should not happen that any of the earlier versions are being used of the calculation sheets. Ensure again proper units are reported, whether it is reporting in kilograms, whether it is reporting in tons, etc. should be very mindful of that when we are looking at this information. And also re review any type of assumptions and estimations that you are doing for to ensure that there is accuracy of, of the information. Okay, there is one more question. What are the ref what are refrigerants have less global warming potential? Is R410A safe and friendly to use? Yes, R410A is definitely one of the newer gases which has been introduced. You will be able to check what is the global warming potential of each of the refrigerants. If you just search for that, GWP of a refrigerant, you will be able to see this information and then understand and estimate whether you want to make those changes in your facility. And this is definitely a conversation you should be having in your environmental management meeting so that you understand how you will be in a position to improve. And uh, yeah, coming back to some of the do nots that we have to be mindful of, do not report data that is not accurate. And do not report estimated data if it is not supported by verifiable and reasonably accurate estimations. If there is a weighing that is done and if the, if the person who is coming to service your facility has, has filled in certain gas by means of estimations, etc., please ensure that you have also got the calculation of how he has arrived at the value that he has got. So how will this be verified? All of the initial data collection processes and data sources will be looked into by the verifier. If you're maintaining your Excel sheets, you would require to understand what are the Excel sheets that you're maintaining. How have you aggregated the total that you're reporting on the platform? And if after the verifier comes and understands that there are certain errors, this error should also be, cal should be corrected on the platform and then reported. There is one more question, which is, do we need to detect, do we need to detection it near chimney vent or can it be near chimney, the outdoors? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand exactly what your question is. If you are, if you're having a chimney, ideally you would be requiring uh, that you have, you have an external test laboratory who is coming in to, to test this to test the gases that are coming out of the chimney or the vent and you will require they will basically decide on how best to analyze this for you 
I hope that answers your question and that was the intent of your question. If not, please reword it and just send this once again. Okay, coming to our quest. So this was on question number three on how it will be verified, the data once it is collect collected. And then we have question four, which is on control devices. Here, the question is, does your facility have control devices or abatement processes for on-site point source air emissions? And if yes, select all sources of emissions that have abatement process. So this question primary, primarily applies to all of your operations processes, for example, your utilities with point source or stack emissions. And so monitoring and maintenance of your control and abatement devices should be included in your factory's preventive maintenance program. And you should have checklists for ongoing visual inspections so that any problems can be identified. And there should also be an effectiveness and efficiency of your control devices that are typically evidenced through monitoring and uh, testing data. So based on the list of sources that have been created from your responses to the applicability questions, you will be asked to respond to the following questions, which is what is the source of uh, the emission, do you have a control device for or an abatement process? And what is the frequency of the monitoring? And here I would also like to talk about what is the definition of a point source emission? We touched upon, this is just a refresher. So you understand that it is a point source emission that we are talking about in our question four, when we are talking about control devices from the operations that happen at the facility. Okay, what's the best frequency practice for monitoring the emission from laboratory annually or biannually? Again, this is completely up to you as to, for you as a facility to decide based on the pollution, pollutant quantity, the type of operations that you have, Perhaps you have operations where one, one month was a very heavy month where you have a lot of production and this could perhaps lead to a lot of pollutants again that is being generated. You might then want to consider whether you want to take, take it biannually or you want to take it only once in a year. So that's again up to you to decide. And it is also based on your local regulations because in certain countries it is required that you have tests which are done every quarter in certain Certain other locations, you can have it once in a year. So it again also depends on your local regulations. Okay. So this is with regard to your question four. And let's come to question five, which is control devices for your production processes. So here the question is, does your facility have control devices or abatement process for on-site fugitive or non-point source air emissions? And if yes, select all fugitive or non-point source air emissions that have control devices or abatement process. So for this question, this primarily applies to all of your operation processes. It, you should not include your your utilities or your point source or stack emissions here. It should only be the processes that actually happen at the facility. And this could again be, you could be having various different processes. Perhaps you have a PP spray, which is done. Perhaps this is controlled with by means of a water curtain. So this is the information that you have to then input into this particular section as to how you are controlling the the fugitive emissions that are coming up from the facilities of, uh, or from the production processes that are happening at the facility. And based again on the list of sources that have been created from your responses in your question number two, you will be then asked as to what is the source, what is the control device, or what is the abatement process that you have implemented. Perhaps for mixing, you have, because it is obnoxious fume that is created perhaps this is being done within glove boxes you can indicate that these processes are done within glove boxes or if there is a water curtain for example in a pp spray if you're using a water curtain you can indicate that your control device is basically the water curtain with which does not uh, uh, get which basically protects the worker from getting the 
fumes that are generated from the PP process. So all of this information then comes under your question number five. And again, just a note on what is the definition for your non-point source fugitive emissions, which is, which will be important for you to understand. Okay, there are some more questions which have now come in, which are how can you capture emissions from refrigerant? So here you, if you want looking to capture emissions or if you're looking to tabulate that, you will have to understand or make an inventory of what are the refrigerants that have been filled into your facility and keep a table, understand from the person who is coming into refill your refrigerant as to what is the total quantity, multiply it by the global warming potential and then tabulate the total quantity. Hig FEM will directly do that for you as well. Uh, we have a printing process in our factory. What kind of control devices need to be installed? Any example. So if it is printing process, then basically it is VOCs which are emitted. So here you will have to study the MSDS of the print pastes that are coming to your facility to understand if there are any kind of VOCs which are generated. Please check under section 9 in your uh, yes, you will be able to see that once you study the MSDS. And if you see that there are VOCs which are generated, you will perhaps require to tabulate. It's a good practice to tabulate the total amount that is generated from the total amount of print paste that you use in a particular year. Okay, how about water scrubber for use for spray painting activity? Is it under fugitive source or point source of emission? If you're using a water scrubber for a spraying activity, this is this will again be uh, considered as a fugitive source and the water scrubber can actually dissolve any kind of pollutants again that is generated from the spray process that is happening. Then there is another question. We had VOCs measurement done in areas where chemicals were found and used. No measured VOC value was found in, in this area. Very good. There is no volatility value in the MSDS of the chemicals. How else can we follow? Perhaps you are not using any chemicals which are having VOCs. So that is why you will not then have to measure and report these VOCs. So it is only when you have you have VOCs and certain print paste and when you're using it, because print paste, there are different types of print paste which are available. There are water-based print paste. There are also solvent-based print paste. So it is in your solvent-based print paste that you will have your VOC measurements and you will see the, these values. You will not see it in all of the uh, all of the MSDSs. And that is something that you might want to discuss with your with your supplier and understand as well. Okay, if the other question is, if a factory installed control device in 2022, but the air emission test report doesn't show any improvement compared to 2021, will they get a mark? Okay, interesting question here, whoever has asked this. I will come to it in question number six. We will be also having an exercise there. Uh, in question number six, basically it is depending on whether you have you are at a particular level in your air emissions reporting that you are given points. You don't, unlike in energy, water and waste, where you have to show improvements from a particular year, you don't have to show it like that in the air emissions section. Okay. Yeah, I think all of the questions have been answered. Let's move on. Coming to question number four and five. Here we wanted to give you an example of how you will be able to bring in control devices for, for your air emissions. And this is an example of a dust collector. So it can, you can have, uh, let's say if there is a lot of dust which is being generated in your facility, you can have this dust collector or a bag filter or even wet scrubbers, etc. For your indoor air, it could be perhaps a fume hood or you could have a solvent recovery, or you could have local exhaust ventilation, which is provided, which will help you to improve the 
air quality. These are all examples of, of control devices which will help you to monitor and curb your pollutants in your uh, premises. So your question number six is, are you managing emissions beyond permit? And has your facility gone beyond permit requirements to achieve a higher level of air performance in your NOx, SOx and particulate matter? So here, this is the, these are the values. So depending on whether you have a small boiler or you have a medium sized boiler or you have a large boiler, based on the capacity of the boiler, you are, IFC has actually recommended certain levels for your NOx, SOx and particulate matter. And it is these values against which it is going to be compared. And how do you achieve a higher level of air performance? You can achieve this via cleaner energy sources. You can have you can use instead of coal, you can use natural gas, you can use renewable energy, you can have air pollution control systems, improving the efficiency or of the conversion of fuel to electricity, removing sulfur from your coal before combustion. All of these are examples of how you will be able to improve the, the emissions that are happening from the facility. And SOX control, you can have flue gas desulfurization. If you have, if you are procuring coal with a lower sulfur content, you will be able to improve the, the kind of pollutant that is generated. This can also be done through dry and wet scrubbers that you can install in your facility. NOX is through flue gas treatment or catalytic filters. Particulate emissions, you can use we, we showed you the dust collection bag bags which which can help you to control the dust that is generated or you can also have electrostatic precipitators fabric filters bag houses or mechanical or inertial collectors you can have your cyclones multi cyclones etc all of them will help you to control your pollutants in terms of particulate matter as well and here we have an exercise which, which, which will be interesting. There is just one more question here. Let me answer that. If my air test report shows uh, results for SOX, how can I report the SOX in question six? Yeah, here you will have to actually upload your report. You will have to upload the la latest test report that you have done for your facility. And it is the verifier who will actually then compare it with the with the IFC parameters that, that we had shown you in the previous slide. So this is actually the exercise that, that is here. And let's say the facility emissions are as follows. I would like you to take a look through all of these numbers here. You have the level one, foundational level, level two, strategic level, and the level three, which is your aspirational level, which is indicated here. And uh, please, please look at these numbers. You have to go with the most strict values. You can see there are two cases which we are showing you here. So which level did the facility achieve? Let me give you a quick poll here, which will help you to answer your question. So I think you should be able to see the poll on your screen right now for the two cases that we are talking about. So here, we the cases here are from the test report that the facility has actually made so there are two cases in the first case your particulate matter is 25 is at when at level 25 and if you look at the particulate matter in case one you can see that it is reaching level three in case one if you look at socks it is it is at 700 
And if you're looking at 700, then it is basically at the strategic level. And NOx is basically at 150, and that is also in level three. But we have to go with the most stringent level. And I can see that you have, I will just show you also the answers that I have received here. So 58% are saying level two for case one, which is right. And for case two, if you look at the values here, it is 70 for particulate matter. So particulate matter here, if you are looking at, it stands at level two. SOX is at 700, which stands again at level two. And NOX is at 150. Sorry, NOX for case two is at 250. Let me just read that again. For case two, particulate matter is at 70. And with 70, you are, you are basically in level two. SOX is at 1200. And because it is at 1200, you are only in the foundational level here for SOX. And for NOx, it is at 250. And so here you are in your strategic level. So this is how you would require to compare. And let me just show you the poll as well. Just share the results here. You are correct or most of you are correct in whatever are the values that you have said. So this is how we would require to compare our values, what we have got from the, from the test report, from the facility, from the latest test report. And this is what we would require to upload. So if you're looking at 2021, you don't have to see the difference between 2021 and 2022, unlike in the energy, water and waste section where you have to report improvement. What you Because this is a limit value here. And what we have to see is that we are still maintaining it in the limit value, within the limit. Okay. All right. The next question here is, if our concentration higher than level one, do we achieve this question? Um, so here, you basically, what you would require to see is that whether your values are coming within level one, two, or three. If it is coming, then you can say a yes to this question. If not, you will have to then say a no to this question. So I hope that answers your question here. Let's move forward. We did now come to the very last question in level three, which is, which is on modernized equipment. So the question here is, do you have a process for implementing modernized equipment to reduce or eliminate air emissions and indoor quality issues at your facility? And there are many ways in which you can have modernized equipment. You can replace the equipment that is there. Maybe there is a particular equipment which is generating a lot of dust Maybe you are doing a lot of VAT dyes. VAT dyes are, have very fine particulate matter and that can create a lot of dust in your facility. One of the ways is, is to change the entire thing and do only liquefied VAT dyes. So you are replacing the complete dry powder. You are replacing it with liquefied VAT dyes. So that's one way in which you, are, you can progress towards a modernized process. You can substitute whatever are the whatever are the kind of the uh, I take again the example of print paste here. You have a solvent based print paste and you also have water based print paste. So say you are substituting your entire solvent based print paste and moving towards a water based print paste. You are then removing the the possibility that there can be air emissions. So that is again one example of how you would be able to use substitution for your modernizing. So for example, ODSs, in case of ODSs, you can use again ODS which have less environmental impact. You can use cleaner fuels like we had talked about sulfur dioxide. We want to reduce the amount of sulfur in the coal. You can procure, for one, you can procure cleaner 
fuel, you can change your machine completely such that you're moving from maybe a coal-based boiler to biogas-based boiler. You can modify the existing equipment. So all of this will give you points in question number seven. And here for question number seven, what you would require to do is a detailed study or an analysis as to what are the type of equipment that you can look at as a facility. And this again has to be an exercise that is done by the environmental management team. It is highly recommended that you do look at what is the modernized equipment that you are in a position to consider. How can you improve the air quality based on both your, both your point source as well as non-point source emissions that are happening within the facility? So this is what you would require to report in HIG FEM. And also any type of reduced emissions because of, let us say, you have shifted or changed all of the equipment from the air conditioning equipment. I'm taking as an example, you have changed all of the air, air conditioning equipment from an R22 to an R32. This is an example, again, where you are trying to reduce any type of you have moved to a modernized equipment or a modernized way in which you would be able to bring down the emissions at your facility. Okay, and we now come to the question and answer section. If there are questions, we can, uh, we can have them answered here. And uh, yes, this is answered. Is any company capturing emission from AC? Yeah, I think what you wanted to ask is whether you are in a position to report if there is a refrigerant, if there is a certain quant quantity of refrigerant which has been added to your air conditioning equipment during the preventive maintenance cycles with your, with your vendor, you will then have to actually understand how much has acted is filled in and HIG FEM will then calculate and say that this is the amount of uh, refrigerant that has escaped from your facility and that will be reported on the platform. So I hope that answers your question or that was the intent of your question. If not, please reword it and send once again. How can we make emission improvement plan particular for AC? Yeah, here you would require to analyze what is the what is the current refrigerant that is used? Do you want, do you, are you using any of the refrigerants which are being phased out, for example, in your particular location? I gave the example of California, look, you know, where the law is coming in saying that they want to ensure that any of the new buildings that are there are not using, are not using, you know, a refrigerant with a global warming potential greater than 750. That is the regulation that is there. If we are wanting to make a plan, we have to first of all understand the situation, understand the local regulation that is required in that particular area and accordingly move to the plan that is required. But yes, California is pretty advanced with their with their requirements, both in terms of chemicals, in terms of air emissions, etc. It might not be the case with many other locations where we are, but we would then need to study. If we have an environmental management team, we would need to see, need to study as to what is the what is the next level that we can go to. Is the data from the WEM issued by? The ministry is the information to be used in fugitive source of emission. I am not 100% certain as to what this question is intending. Sorry, please reword this and send this back to me. And how do you get the right emission factor for electricity in different countries? Very good question, Wilson. This is, this is good. You can look at the emission factor tables that are provided. You have EPA, which is giving you an emission factor table for many different locations. This is one way in which you would be able to look at emission factor for electricity. 
and also you might have local values which are available so if you have local values which are reported and which are available it is preferable to use that if not go with the emission factor that is there for the epa platform that is what we would recommend at present we are not capturing emission from refrigerant our score will be reduced you don't have to capture emission from the refrigerant it is automatically calculated based on how much refrigerant you have refilled at your facility so hic platform automatically calculates it it does not require you to actually calculate that so long as you are reporting if you say that you are filling in refrigerants but you do not know the value or what the volume that you have filled in then you will lose points otherwise it you will not lose points okay i think we have done with most of the questions here uh, you are free to connect of course with me over mails and i'll be happy to help you and finally we come to you with our offer for verification services that that we do across the globe we have a lot of people in the market who are verifiers who will help you with the queries that you will have and also help you to improve upon your hig fpm performance so you can see that we are located in india in bangladesh tunisia indonesia turkey china vietnam law we have we have mania as well and also pakistan so please do get in touch with our verifiers if you just hover your mouse over the name you will see the email address that you will require to get in touch with and you can you can be rest assured that they will definitely be corresponding with you and helping you with the verification requirements or also the training requirements so we also do a lot of consultancies it all over the globe and should you want to improve on your impact area in a particular impact area or the entire fem we are also open to those kind of queries and here we provide you with all of the registration links as well as the recording links that have happened for 2022 every year we give you an update of what has changed in the hig fem and how you would require to report it on the platform i hope you are able to gain a lot of value with this information that's provided and we we sincerely hope that you will be able to also join us for the remaining webinars we have two more which are coming up one is on waste and one is on chemicals management very shortly and these are the registration links here please do attend and join into the session or send one of your team members who will be able to benefit from this okay and this is our team world over yes we will definitely be sharing the slides you will get the slides in a follow up mail and all of the recordings you will be able to see this on the leadership and sustainability youtube channel it is being uploaded there and you will also get a link to to watch this in a follow up mail is there a program from hig fm side which will help or or aware industries with minimum emission as production will increase with the increase in demand good question ankit there there is not currently any kind of program which is there but what hig fem is trying to do is sensitize the people to the emissions that are there with the productions that happen and i think all of these sessions that we are doing will help you to understand how you would be able to improve and we are happy to also connect one on one later and uh, give you this information so thank you everybody for attending the session it was a pleasure to be with you and see you in our next webinar bye bye